it's just different perspectives and ways to look at it. So I'm going to cover the first two, and then I'm going to turn the microphone to Solar Sunrise. So where we really, I was a, many people are even surprised that there's even a history for us to be talking about. Um, there's a sense that internet was largely a peaceful place maybe into the 2000s, and it was only really in the 2000s when bad things were happening, and prior to that it was, it was pretty utopian. And we found it wasn't, that's not quite true. Um, the first main case that we looked at um, was a case called the Cuckoo's Egg. It was 1986. There were a, a U.S. astronomer, um, someone that looks, spends his time looking at the stars, um, noticed a 75-cent billing error um, in his computer systems. Um, and as he pulled strings and kept looking and looking more, um, he found that there were intruders in the, his system at one of the U.S. national labs, and they were looking for classified information on Ronald Reagan's plan to shoot down missiles called Star Wars or Strategic Defense Initiative. The more he pulled, the more he was able to help figure out that it traced back to Germany and German hackers who were selling their information to the KGB. So I talk about this case quite a bit in Washington, D.C., to people at United States Cyber Command or the Pentagon or the White House. And they never knew that cyber espionage is not in the last 10 years. It actually goes back over 25 years. The second case was the Morris worm, which wasn't quite a conflict. And let me come back with what I, how I'm using that word conflict, because it's it may be new to some of you in this context, where a um, U.S. college student, Robert Tappan Morris, wrote a quick piece of code that quickly took down something like 10% of the early Internet. Um, took down something like um, 6,000 of the 60,000 computers that were on the Internet back in 1988. And what the responder what the people responding found was they could not respond fast enough. They had only been ad hoc, only coming together when something bad happened. And now there was something so big, um, the diff they had quite a bit of difficulty responding to something of this size and scale, especially because the way they normally coordinated was using the Internet itself, and now the Internet itself was what was unreliable. And we'll come back and look at some of the lessons from these and the other cases. But I'd like to turn the microphone over to Tim. Thank you, Jay. Um, first of all, can I ask all of you a question and ask who has heard of Solar Sunrise before? One, two, three, four, five. OK, great. Um, so as you can tell, I was at the time uh, not old enough to actually follow this uh, from a Perce the perception of a participant. Uh, so I invite all of you to uh, uh, join uh, later on in terms of how you've perceived it at the time and what your uh, perception is of how it fits into the narrative. Um, so I come from this a little bit more from the academic perspective because, uh, as you all know, um, the militaries of the world have become increasingly um, uh, interested in using the Internet for political and military purposes as well. And I'm interested of how we got to where we are today and how we're certain things perceived and framed to, to get us where we are today, something that I think Jay um, has been focusing on as well through his work and the book. Um, and if you looked at, there was a new study that came out a few months ago in terms of the number of governments developing military doctrines, and you actually are now um, see, have seen an increase compared to the study that we, the first study that came out just a year ago, and I'm happy to point you to, to the website if, uh, if you're interested. And, and uh, Tim, if I can join in, jump in on that point. A lot of what you're seeing here also is we could have almost called this topic, uh, you know, the, the militarization of U.S. cyber policy because a lot of these cases walk through about how the U.S. military started to get more and more interested and started raising it to higher and higher level generals. Um, that could have been an interesting alternate title for the panel. And uh, the second caveat that I'd like to make is uh, the terminology that I'm going to use uh, and to flag that um, this uh, community uses terms in a certain way that in other parts of the Internet policy area will be used differently. So I will probably reference attribution uh, a couple of times in my presentation, which if from the human rights framework is what we 
uh, praise as the anonymity that the internet allows and that you can uh, do certain things without having to, uh, to worry about being uh, detected or monitored. But in the security realm, that's the attribution problem in terms of actually tracing the attack back and making life more difficult, which raises some interesting questions when the two policy areas converge. But that's for maybe another panel at next DOJ. Um, so I'm going to take you back 15 years in time uh, to February of 1998, um, which is when Operation Solo Sunrise took place. And just to give you a broader perspective in terms of the, the geopolitics at the time, um, it was a point in time where tensions with Iraq were at a high. Um, you had um, the debate over the UN uh, weapon inspectors who were in Iraq uh, in order to look for weapons of mass destruction. Um, and there was a big back and forth in terms of whether they were actually able to carry out their work in the country. And it got to a point where Saddam Hussein threatened to expel uh, the weapon inspectors and in response the UN Security Council issuing certain statements but the US also deploying uh, at one point 2,000 Marines bringing the troop level in the region up to 45,000 and having three aircraft carriers deployed which if you as you know, uh, want to engage in a conflict is critical to have those uh, in the region. So we were at a point of very intense, uh, of a very intense moment in uh, the region, and people at the Pentagon were wondering if war had already broken out, because something that they knew, but that the rest of the world didn't know, was that someone was trying was accessing and intruding uh, systems of the Department of Defense in the U.S. And this took place uh, for three weeks, uh, from February 1st until February 26th, and it w therefore coincided uh, directly with uh, uh, what was happening at the geopolitical stage at the highest level. Solo Sunrise, in terms of uh, what the malware actually did, it exploited a vulnerability in the Solaris operating system, which had uh, been well known, um, and it was traced back uh, from the forensics perspective to, uh, among others, um, the United Arab Emirates, which was one of the few gateways actually leading directly to Iraq, uh, which is what got the uh, officials at the Department of Defense uh, very uh, nervous because of everything that was going on, and there was a, there was a fear that the uh, attack was actually coming out of Iraq and was part of a, of a lead-up to the military conflict and with potential spillover effects uh, to, the, to the conflict at large. Um, I think it's important uh, to point out from the start that what we're talking about is not a destructive payload, that this was actually exfiltration. So Solo Sunrise intruded systems um, and uh, planted a sniff of malware in order to uh, copy passwords. Um, it did not access um, classified networks. However, it did access the global transportation system, the defense uh, finance system, um, so systems that were, would have been connected to uh, a military conflict. The reason why this also attracted a lot of attention at the Department of Defense at the time was because the department had just concluded uh, its first military exercise that would simulate it, uh, an attack on the Department of Defense's network. So shortly after that took place, um, the, the exercise was called Eligible Re uh, Receiver, you actually saw this happening in real time, which uh, I think a lot of the people who consider this still to be the future of warfare uh, uh, quite nervous. Um, it was first detected through the Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team uh, that noticed the root level compromise at the Andrews Air Force Base and quickly realized that this was uh, not only occurring at the Andrews Base but uh, at other facilities as well. Um, and what was interesting about the payload, apart from it being uh, a sniffer malware, the uh, intruders actually patched the vulnerability as soon as they had gotten uh, root access so that uh, no one else could exploit it. So in, in that sense, they were actually uh, quite smart in making sure that they were the only ones. Uh, and if I can highlight something that you had just said, it was very interesting because the Pentagon had just gone through this, this exercise that Tim had mentioned, eligible receiver. So, and, and this was briefed up to the president. Um, that how serious this was. It was a very high level exercise. And so they, the military is primed to be thinking about cyber war. They were already having just exercised it. And then they turn around and just a couple of months later, they, they're pretty sure cyber war is now on. 
And as uh, Jay Healy mentioned, this actually was uh, got to the level of the president. So you had uh, the Secretary of Defense going to the president saying, uh, we have a situation here, we don't know yet where it's coming from. So this wasn't just something that uh, some low-level department uh, defense officials were worried about. This got to the level of the president, which I think underlines uh, some of the uh, things that we still see uh, today when we talk about cyber war, and I'm using uh, quotes when I use the term, and cyber warfare. Um, what happened afterwards is, as you can imagine, uh, people tried to figure out where it was coming from. And as with many attacks that we still see today, um, you saw the attacks being routed through, among others, university networks and networks that are known to be easy to use uh, if you want to kind of hide your tracks. Um, the Department of Defense was involved, as well as the FBI, which would uh, eventually take over uh, the, the investigation. Um, and the... The hypotheses of who was behind this range from Iraq, uh, which was the most disconcerting, to some Dutch hackers, and um, eventually a joint task force was um, set up that I think Jay will probably talk about, uh, hopefully talk about uh, later a little bit. But it turned out that it was not Iraq, it was not Dutch hackers, or hackers in another country uh, per se. It was two Californian teenagers. <laughs> Um, <laughs> known by the pseudonym of Machiavelli and Stimpy, uh, who was a popular rapper at the time for the people who uh, were listening to rap in the 90s. Um, but it turned out that they were actually not acting uh, alone. They were mentored by an Israeli hacker uh, known by the pseudonym of The Analyzer, um, who made, again, some headlines a few years ago uh, and has been arrested for subsequent hacks afterward. Um, and the reason and the way that they found out about the Israeli hacker being involved was actually hubris. He was boasting about it in chat for. And um, the person he was boasting uh, to about this decided to take this to the authorities and therefore point them in the right direction. And this is how it all ended up being uh, resolved in terms of the investigation, finding out who's, who's behind it. Um, so I'm going to keep this short and just, therefore just want to close with um, three quick takeaways. So this, so what's interesting for me from Solar Sunrise is it shows some problems we still face today in terms of the attribution problem and the difficulties to actually trace back an attack um, or an intrusion in this case. Um, and I'm using cyber attack in a very liberal way here. We still don't have a standing definition of what a cyber attack actually is. It sounds a lot worse than intrusion. Uh, so if we talk about framing and words, the use of words uh, to highlight a problem, uh, I think it's interesting that this has been used since the 90s as the, the, our mental frame to think about these issues. Um, and to just bring it back to a recent event in terms of the attribution problem, and something that I think is very important when we think about this is uh, how important it is to be cautious about the reaction after such an intrusion take, took place. Some of you might have heard of the uh, attack that took place in South Korea at the beginning of the year um, against some of the South Korean financial institutions. And if you watch this development closely, the South Korean actually came out and accused China first of being the source uh, of the attack, only to retract that statement two days later because they realized that the IP address that they had assumed to be the source of this was the public IP address linked to, a chi to China but they had mistaken that for the internal IP address of one of the financial networks that had been affected. Um, and therefore, uh, in terms of being cautious about uh, jumping to conclusions too quickly and the ability of uh, whoever's actually behind it to cover their tracks, I think is something that's, that's worth uh, pointing out here. And th thank you, Tim. And, uh, and thanks for phrasing that the way you did. Because if you notice, as I mentioned, we're talking about cyber conflicts here. You're not going to hear us really talk about cyber wars. Because um, we think, uh, well, I think, and I think probably the panel does, that we have not had a real war yet. I mean, wars are violent, deadly, bloody, bloody things. And, and through all of the wake-up calls we see here, we've seen um, certainly tension and cyber attacks and other things, but as we did our cyber conflict history book, we couldn't find a single case of anyone that had died from a cyber attack that I know of. I don't know if, if, well, if my other panelists. I was going to Okay, I'll leave that. Georgia is, oh. you know, paired with the military. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm going to give that. So, so Bill is going to talk about that uh, next. 
Um, and I also call it here at wake up calls because each one of these, um, and this is the reason why there's a question mark on US espionage, um, all of these have led to significant changes, organizational changes, ways that we look at, at, at the internet and cyberspace afterwards. And each one of them, therefore, also has implications for how we're thinking about internet governance. After the, the one that um, Tim had just mentioned, um, the, uh, the military realized they had no one in charge, and it led to the creation of the first cyber command. Um, first, it was only doing defense in 1998. I, I had helped set it up. And then within a year, it was also coordinating United States offense actions. So we're talking about 2000. We already had the first US military cyber command to be doing offense and defense. Um, we're going to jump forward um, to number six on the list here for Estonia and Georgia. And for that, I'm, I'm actually, um, I just dug up some slides that I did back at the time um, in 2008. And I think I'm going to try and put them up since they offer a little bit of a view into history. Do you mind? Um, hang on just a moment. You can tell that, that Bill is more technical than the rest of us because I would have never have been so bold to try, and, to try and do this, but Bill can get away with it because he's a techie. And so as we're talking about these cyber conflicts, there are times that we're going to um, uh, be impolite. I mean, there are times where I'm going to say the United States did this, like Stuxnet. There are times we're going to say the Chinese did this, like espionage. Or there are times we're going to say the Russians did this. Um, and again, I'm, I'm approaching this as a historian myself. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to, to speak about cyber conflicts largely between nations. When we say cyber conflict, we're ruling out kind of by definition most of the things that might be crime. We're generally not including acts of, of hacktivism. Um, it's really the things largely with national security implications between them. Um, so that's because it's largely between nation states what we're talking about here. Um, we do have to, to bring up nations. We're not doing that to be rude. We're doing it because it is about trying to talk about accurate history. So. Um this is uh, just two slides from a briefing I gave NATO at the end of 2008 um, on uh, what what had happened at, in Estonia and Georgia. Um, and it has a lot more detail than I would probably be able to easily dig up again now. Uh, and also it's, I don't know, it, it's its own sort of view into the way we were thinking about it at the time. Um, so. Uh, the interesting thing to note here is that governments often sort of get this very myopic view, right? Something comes up in the press, and they get excited about it, and they think that's the one thing that's ever happened. Um, but what you see here is that, you know, there was one thing that I knew about in 2005 that the Russians had done, eight events in 2007 and seven in 2008, right? So... It wasn't like Estonia and Georgia were the only things that Russia was doing at that time. Um, they were actually part of a, a very uh, consistent um, series of actions that by and large used the same botnets, by and large had the same attack signatures and so forth. Um, so uh, let, me, let me just kind of dive in and talk a little bit about Estonia. Um, at the time that the... Uh, Russians attacked Estonia, which came with a little warning. A lot of these things come with a bit of warning. Like uh, last year, the anonymous attack against the root name servers, that came with six weeks of warning. And in six weeks, we were able to deploy um, about $8 million worth of additional routing equipment to protect the root servers. Um, so, so a little bit of warning goes a long way with these attacks. Um, so the warning came in, uh, and the Russians were trying to uh, recruit inside Estonia. Um, uh, like the Chinese in Mongolia, um, the Russians after World War II uh, funded a lot of Russian emigration to Estonia so that there would be ethnic Russians 
in Estonia, kind of a colonization program. And um, so the problem is that Estonian language and culture are not uh, easily penetrable. And so there were, at this time, third generation ethnic Russian Estonians living in Estonia who, you know, had no uh, working knowledge of, of the Estonian language, for instance, right? They're very, very separate culture within Estonia. Um, the Russians, by and large, uh, have worked very closely from the Chinese playbook, right? The Chinese have a, a big military academic um, uh, body of literature on cyber warfare. And, you know, you can get Chinese academic military journals and read what it is that they think about this stuff. And, uh, I mean, in translation, of course. Um, and the Russians, of course, do that as well. And so a lot of what you see the Russians doing follows these sort of Chinese doctrine right down to the letter. And in this case, a big part of the Chinese doctrine is this uh, notion of the people's army, right? That uh, the in time of conflict, the people form up around the uh, cadre of trained people who are military professionals, but everybody does their part. And the theory uh, with the um, with attacks against other countries is that there would be, you know, Chinese nationals living in those countries who would be able to, you know, attack behind the lines, right? And so the Russians take that very literally, and they go to Estonia, and they say, who are the Russians in Estonia? They can help us uh, conduct this attack inside Estonia. But that's, um, that's an attack against law and order, right? That's a insurgency. Um, which means the Estonians are conducting a counterinsurgency here, an appeal to law and order. So the Estonians said, basically, hey, um, you know, your second cousins in Moscow uh, have trouble finding, you know, decent groceries in the grocery store. Their plumbing doesn't work all the time. The electricity isn't that reliable. Law enforcement isn't that good. You've got it really good here in Estonia, right? Why? Why would you attack that? Why would you go against that? And at the same time, they found the Russian agent who was running around recruiting, uh, threw him in jail, said, you know, we're locking him up. He's never going to see the light of day again. So this is a very effective counterinsurgency, right? You say, here are the benefits of what it is we're offering, and that's the carrot, right? And the stick is if you try and violate that, you know, compact of civilization, uh, you know, you get thrown in jail. Um, so uh, then when the attack came, there was no domestic participation. Uh, there were not uh, ethnic Russian Estonian hackers uh, running botnets inside Estonia. And that made the attack a much, much simpler thing to deal with. Um, so uh, two of us in this room uh, were in the room. Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. We're, we're almost there. We're almost there. Um, so uh, Medica Keo, who is sitting right back there and waving, uh, is like most Estonians from New Jersey, um, <laughs> like like the president of Estonia. Um, uh, she was there, uh, as was Curtis Linkvist, who was uh, from the uh, sort of Swedish government, a, a private-public partnership that operates uh, critical infrastructure in Sweden. Um, so Curtis and I were both members of NSPSEC, which is the um, uh, coordination body that deals with attacks um, against the Internet infrastructure. And so we were there acting as liaisons to the CERT because there was nobody in the EE CERT who had yet been vetted into NSPSEC at that time. Uh, so we were helping coordinate the international response, the filtering of the attack. So along comes the attack. It's 11 p.m. in uh, Tallinn, midnight in Moscow. 
what the Russians had done is hired one month worth of attack from two different botnets. So, you know, it starts at midnight, you know, when they paid for it to start. And um, uh, so huge, huge, huge attack. It was something like 20 times the normal uh, daily peak for incoming traffic for Estonia. Um, it pretty well swamps everything, but Estonia had two domestic internet exchange points, so they had a way of producing bandwidth domestically. They weren't dependent upon bringing it all in from the outside. So these attacks that were swamping the inbound bandwidth were not precluding domestic communication. They were precluding communication with the outside world. But it was 11 p.m., so not that many people were really trying to talk to people outside at that point. Um, and uh, so the, the response basically happened over the next seven hours, got it damped down to the point where it wasn't really noticeable anymore by about 6, 7 a.m. the next morning, you know, before people were getting to work. So really the attack didn't have much of any practical effect. Um, and, you know, you could still sort of, if you were measuring closely, you could still see it, that it was there, but it had been damped down so well that it wasn't actually impeding anybody's ability to get their jobs done. So regular users weren't noticing it. Um, the, uh, and then a month later, you could see it end, right, when, when what they'd paid for came to an end. Um, so it was, it was just a straight-up BDoS. It was coming in from the outside, from botnets. Uh, the Russians, of course, pointed out that uh, since they had hired US-based botnets largely, uh, that it was the US that was attacking Estonia. Um, the Estonians, of course, had just joined NATO at that point, so they appealed to NATO, and NATO kind of threw up their hands and said, uh, uh, computers, uh, the future, something. Um, <laughs> And then a few years later, as an apology, they built a, uh, a center of cyber excellence in Tallinn uh, to, to apologize for not having done anything. Um, I was going to flip to the next slide quickly. Um, but and while you're doing that, I, I like because a lot of what a lot of the dialogue that you hear about Estonia um, is it was a cyber war and Estonia was wiped off the network. I mean, when I when when I hear that, that tends to be the myth that's out there, and, and you're saying neither of those is really yeah, true, right? Not, not, not at all. Um, the, the really interesting contrast here is between Estonia and Georgia. So Estonia had a really good CERT that was well-organized, well-trained, uh, really well-coordinated with the Internet service providers there, um, and more importantly, really well-coordinated with law enforcement. So unlike most CERTs that are run by somebody who comes out of a computer science security background, um, there's run by a guy who came out of financial crimes detective law enforcement background, which was sort of perfect in a lot of ways. And what that meant was he was able to, you know, call up his buddies who were still in law enforcement and say, hey, go arrest that guy, you know, make sure it's in the headlines tomorrow morning. And then a week later, they let the guy go, right? They didn't, I don't think they even charged the, the Russian kid, the Nashi agent. Um, yeah, I don't think they even charged him, right? The point was to make the headlines about how, you know, he was going to live the rest of his life in jail and you don't want to also live the rest of your life in jail, so don't participate in the attack, right? That was what mattered. Anyway, so um, sort of following the buck back, uh, the reason why Estonia got attacked, oh, sorry, I, I got sidetracked there. So difference between Estonia and Georgia, um, really good cert two internet exchange points inside the country, and their external connectivity was to countries that they were relatively allied with, right? So other Baltic and Scandinavian countries that they had good diplomatic relations with, with clueful internet service providers on the other end of the circuit who they could call up and say, here's the attack signature, filter it. Um, by contrast, if you look at Georgia, no cert, no internet exchange points, Six of the seven circuits that they had into the fiber cables into the country went to Russia, which was the country that was attacking them, and one went to Turkey. That was it. Right? So huge difference between 
uh, Russia, or sorry, between Estonia and Georgia. Uh, in Georgia, the attack was pretty successful. Basically, the country was offline for, you know, the better part of a couple months, and the entire government had to roll over uh, onto Google free business services. Is is the mic acting up? I can't tell. I don't know. Um, it's actually just kind of is it? I don't know. Right. Anyway, um, so so going back to sort of how this how this played out, um, the. The Russian government, per se, doesn't want to publicly take credit for a state actor attack, right? So what they do is Nashi, which is the Putin youth support organization, stands up and says, oh, we did it, right? This is the patriotic hacker thing, right? They say, oh, oh, we, we take full responsibility. Um, when it was pointed out that that wasn't entirely plausible because they get their orders from the FSB, the FSB Center for Information Security said, oh, yeah, but it was just something that we thought of, and, you know, they, they ran with it, and that, you know, that's the end of it. But that still doesn't really explain why. To get to why, you've got to look at the oil politics, right? Oil and gas politics are what drive almost all of this stuff internationally from Russia. And so what had happened was there was a the the Polish government so there were gas pipelines going from Russia to Germany, which was a huge export market for Russia for natural gas at that point. They go through Poland. Poland had tried to up the export or up the, the, the tax on the gas going through. And that ticked off the Russians. And the Russians said, well, we're gonna put in a new pipeline that bypasses Poland and that was the Nord Stream pipeline, and that was supposed to go through the Baltic around to, to Germany. And it turned out that Vladislav Surkov, who was Putin's uh, chief of staff, had personally invested a huge amount of his money in that pipeline, and the Estonians vetoed the pipeline on basically uh, 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 ecological reasons, right? Digging up the seafloor in the Baltic is not the greatest idea when the Russians have been dumping nuclear waste in there since World War II. Um, so, so they vetoed the pipeline, and Surkov, who was the founder of NASHI, and issues a lot of orders to the FSB, uh, is the one, effectively, who asked for this to happen. And, and for very personal reasons, right? So you get, you get back to it, and this wasn't really a Russian governmental action in this case. It was just somebody very senior in the Russian government who was able to pull a lot of strings and make it happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so Georgia, um, Georgia was very different in that that was in association with a uh, an actual military action. Again, it was uh, gas pipeline. Um, the Georgians had uh, negotiated a deal for a gas pipeline with the uh, with the Russians, and then they backed out of the deal and signed a deal with the U.S. instead. So the Russians attacked them, tanks rolled, and they did a cyber attack in conjunction with that, and it was very effective. The only thing that kept them online at all was um, Turkish Telecom, for once, uh, stood up and made it go. Anyway. So a lot of... Yeah, well, I don't know. I think this one's dying on us. So um, <coughs> some of the things that Bill brought up in there, I mean... There is warning. I mean, a lot of times we're told that there is no warning for, for cyber attacks. And, and what we've found as we've looked at these as conflicts is, is that's not quite true because almost all of the conflicts we're talking about here take place within a larger national security framework where nations, rival nations, are angry at one another. And so true, you might have a daily cyber attack, you might have daily, you might have cyber crime, you might have hacktivists. Um, and those, any individual attack might be difficult to warn about, but the most damaging cyber attacks, the kinds that we're talking about here as cyber conflict, almost always take place in a larger context of rivalries between nations that's starting to heat up into an actual geopolitical crisis rather than just something that happens on the network. And again, I think as we're talking about cyber conflict and cyber warfare, these has big implications for how we're thinking about internet governance. Um, these tend not to be spooky cyber conflicts. They tend to be 
conflicts between nations that happen to spill over into cyberspace. So we've been talking so far about a very mis military and intelligence dominated um, situation because that's how we get to conflict, but that's not the only way to be looking at this. And Japan has had a very different way of approaching many of the same, same problems. So I think next we'll turn to Yuri Ito. Thank you, Jay. Um, good afternoon. So uh, in Japan, we see also um, hacking attacks are being used for a variety of political purposes between, especially, especially between China, Korea, and Japan. Uh, so activity appears to be going on, ongoing, and it's increasingly um, causing confrontation between um, the parties. And what is not really good is the fears regarding internet attacks could lead to political crisis or, you know, more broadly increasing the chance of conflict um, escalation between the countries. So um, as a result, um, China, Japan, and Korea have identified a need um, to have more effective conflict management approach um, to the, you know, cyber conflict. So when these things happen, you know, we want to make sure we have um, stable point of contact and a process and procedure and policy how to respond to that and be ready um, when these things happen. Um, so the collaboration framework really divides us to two um, layers by function. Um, one layer is a third computer emergency response team um, and the other layer is government. Um, it also, um, so this, this collaboration defines the process and policy of collaboration response. So when um, the cyber attacks occurs triggered by, for example, some um, political conflict, we quickly notify each other um, and um, we have a process to start the joint emotion response team between the teams. So um, with that joint emergency response team, we share the monitoring. Um, we use a different language. So monitoring, um, joint monitoring, and ask the other you know, side of the team to monitoring what's going on in that cyberspace and who's talking and you know, what's going on, where's attack management, where is the you know, malware um, or you know, a place where people go and you know, download the bot you know, and become a self-bot to, you know, conduct the attack. You know, we monitoring those things and sharing each other. Um, so we have a process to, you know, work together. Um, and then we, you know, making sure that, so sometimes this type of um, point of contact, um, when we talked about this uh, point of contact, um, sometimes we use this confident confidence building measures um, and then the nuclear risk reduction center analogy where there is a red you know line you know phones between two conflicting you know countries and whenever there's something there was a there is a stable you know um, communication path so that there's a conflict in the incident or not going to unnecessarily escalating to the conflict um, with the interpretation, you know, wrong interpretations or misunderstanding. Um, one of the things that I see the difference from the nuclear re risk reduction CBM and the cyber um, confidence building measures as the start to providing the stable point of contact is the nuclear risk, you know, nuclear, you know, it's, it's a government running facility and the government owning and then it's a government, you know, um, confidence building measures. But the, in the cyber, most of the cyberspace are consisted and, you know, operated by a private sector. So what we did is keep the technical and operation layer from the political policy layer and make sure the technical layers are firstly 
you know, always contacted. Um, despite all that difficult time for the policymakers to communicate. Um, so, can I just highlight something sure. on, on that, if my mic is going to work here? Because um, I think it's an important point for internet governance. And both what Bill has been talking about and Yuri is, you know, in Bill's case, there he never or he rarely talked about a government action on the defense. Right? It was largely the private sector groups like NFPSEC, the large telcos and others that were riding to the rescue of the country under the countries under attack. Um, and likewise, in, in as Yuri is talking about, it's a separation of the political and technical level, and a lot of the techies are private sector. And we saw this repeatedly in the book as we looked at cyber conflicts, and few, if any, were ever decisively resolved by government. And I think this is an important point as we're thinking about internet governance. Because the biggest problems that cyberspace has been facing is getting solved by the private sector. Now you can say the private sector is causing a lot of the problems too, or non-states are causing a lot of the problems. But that doesn't take away from the fact that it's largely the companies and non-states that are solving it. So I think that continues to point to the importance of the multi-stakeholder model. I'm sorry to join in on that, but I thought that was an important, an important time to, to join in. a little bit myself. Um, the, uh, I think the reason why uh, governments aren't really able to do anything is because they just don't have resources. Uh, the Internet's a private sector thing, and it takes a lot of resources to be able to ride out a big attack, and, um, you know, it's the ISPs that have those resources. Um, the, and the, the one big exception is China, right? In China, you've got far less separation between what's governmental and what's private sector, and so you've got China Telecom acting as an agent of the Chinese foreign policy a lot of the time. And so we really, that, that's one of the really tricky things in this area is how, how, do, how does the West or how do non-Chinese countries counter this sort of tie-up between Chinese private sector and Chinese government, because we don't want to do the same thing because it's not who we are, but it's a very strong position that the Chinese have, and we don't really have a countervailing strength. And I would, I would, I would even generalize that point of the more we try and put, give government leading roles in internet especially on response, which is what this panel is, is largely talking about, governments tend not to have the resources, as Bill just said. They also tend not to have the subject matter expertise compared to companies. They also tend not to have, strongly tend not to have the agility to be able to respond quickly enough. So that's why I think multi-stakeholder model continues to be really important because if governments try to take, increasingly take over the role of response, then I think the attackers are going to continue to have the edge because governments don't have the resources, the, I'm sorry, they don't have the subject matter expertise, they don't have the agility. In many cases, they don't have the resources to respond. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, um, escalation process to government is, you know, country, co country by country, it's different. So we have to reach out and find out what's the best but, you know, this escalation process is very important. It's really important to make, you know, from the technical, pers you know, technical community, make sure that the government are not going up to panic and then say, oh, there's a big attack coming from China and there's a state-sponsored and blah, this is going to be the cyber warfare. We are not, we have a big role to making sure that we're handling it other side is knowing about this. We're aware we're working together and make sure, you know, policy layers, or, you know, governments are stably and really working with the stakeholders domestically to make sure this is under control. That's, I think, the government's big role. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, the Chinese espionage uh, and Stuxnet. U.S. espionage, and then, and then I want to leave half hour for questions if, if you have any. If not, I've got a few of the panel. I talk about the different China, Chinese espionage and, and, and U.S. style um, because of, we've learned a lot in, uh, in 2013 about U.S. espionage, so I'm not going to cover very much about that. 
Um, I'll combine it with Stuxnet, though. So the way the U.S. tends to, to collect information tends to be, I mean, if, at least if we can believe the, the Snowden revelations, we like to collect it all, is what General Alexander from National Security Agency has, has if they can, at the backbone. If the U.S. does intrusions, breaking into companies, breaking into places, that tends to be r relatively quiet and relatively um, precise. Um, and we also see that kind of precision in the Stuxnet and Olympic Games attacks that we learned about um, two years ago. This was um, attacks, um, apparently U.S. and Israel against the Iranian uh, uranium enrichment programs, um, a very sophisticated piece of malicious software um, that we've got a nice case study of in the book, uh, along with a few intelligence collection um, pieces of malware that went along with it. And it was seen to be a U.S. operation, an Israel operation, not just because of the target, but also because of the style. Um, it was a U.S. attack, and uh, Dick Clark, who had been at the White House before me, pointed out it, this must have been the U.S. Look at how many lawyers must have been involved in this. Um, because it, it spread, but it was extremely precisely engineered to only break things in a very specific set of parameters that only existed in one place in the world, um, in Natan's uranium enrichment. And that, to me, is very indicative of this U.S. style of being exceptionally precisely targeted to only hit one specific thing. Um, U.S. tends not to use proxies. We found almost no examples in our, in our history of where the U.S. Um, gave a green light to hacktivists to hack on, to hack on its behalf. This is all very different from what seems to be um, the style from China, which uses, as Bill mentioned, a lot more patriotic hackers. Um, if, there's, if there's tension going on in the East China or South China Sea, you can expect that there's going to be patriotic hacking that goes along with it. Um, uh, the, whereas the U.S. espionage can, can either be very quiet and widespread or very quiet and... Um, intrusive into specific companies. Uh, the Chinese espionage that we, we've found traces going back 10 years of it being a significant issue, probably even farther back, of has been much more unrestrained and, and, and aggressive. The um, uh, Eugene Kaspersky from uh, the virus company, the, the anti-malware company, has talked about going to companies and they've found seven different Chinese groups within the same company, all collecting different kinds of information and reporting back to different, um, to different masters in China. Now, again, I'm not trying to... So the U.S. style is much more coordinated between the intelligence community, between NSA, CIA, with the, with the White House, um, much more targeted um, if they're intruding into a place, um, and generally far, more, far quieter of going in. We only know about a lot of these operations because they got leaked from the inside rather than they got detected. Very different from the, from the much larger Chinese. Um, so to just close on Stuxnet and Iran versus United States, um, we only know or we largely know about this because of the Stuxnet attack, because the malware um, was detected, got widely reported, um, as well as other ones in the same fam that appear to be in the same family, like Flame. Um, pr it seems that there have been, this is only one um, campaign in a larger conflict between the United States and Iran. Um, and it appears that large attacks like Shamoon and denial of service attacks on the U.S. finance sector are part of that. So it's difficult to know much of the truth because it's happening in the shadows. So I'm going to close right there. We just hit um, not, not quite one hour, and just to see if there are any questions from people online or here in the audience. I've only got one working mic, so if you ask the question, and then I'll repeat it, and we'll see how that works. Sir. Um, there's a, a development in London called the Talon Manual, um, and my name is Mike Kelly. I'm a law professor at Creighton University. My colleague, Sean Ross, was one of the authors 
flying a DAF log floor with a cyber console. And it's a three volume set. And it's, you know, it sounds like the US is already uh, adapting, you know, proportionality rules and necessity rules of warfare to what it does in the cyber field. But other states are not. Can the US move things? Intellectual product. So the question um, is on the Tallinn Manual, which was from um, the NATO Cyber Defense Center, had gotten together a, a number of international law scholars to look at how existing international humanitarian law, that is, the laws of armed conflict, can apply to cyberspace. And um, beforehand, the United States, UK, Australia, a few other countries have said for several years that things like the Geneva Convention apply on cyberspace just as well as anywhere else. Basic human rights, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, apply in cyberspace um, as they do in the real world. Um, now there might be, we can argue about exactly how, um, but that's been, that's been the official policies and we can see that in, in, in the Stuxnet attacks. Um, this year has seen, 2013, has seen a lot, uh, one of the largest cases of agreement between countries, the UN Group of Governmental Experts. So if you're interested in this topic, I would, I would urge you to look at the G Group of Government Experts report because you had US, China, Russia, 12 other countries, um, Germany, Australia, all agree that inter uh, existing international laws do apply to cyberspace. So if we're talking about arms control, if we're talking about other issues, um, the U.S. position has long been that you've got Geneva Convention, you've got these other conventions, and let's start from there before we invent something new. I think one of the big distinctions that needs to be made is between intelligence and military. And that line is much more flexible in cyberspace, or it's being taken as being much more flexible. And so... Governments are never willing to constrain their actions in the intelligence side of things, whereas in the military side of things, they're much more willing to, you know, come up with treaties and say, oh, you know, we're not going to massacre civilians and so forth, right? The massacring civilians is just fine on the intelligence side, though. Um, so, of course, everything gets defined as an intelligence action rather than a military action. Um, I, I think also it's not necessarily quite fair to make it sound like the U.S. is leading some charge towards, um, you know, public documentation and so forth. As I said, I mean, the Chinese have been publishing on this since the early 80s, like 83, 84, right? We're, we're 30 years into public Chinese doctrine uh, from their military on, on cyber warfare. Um, and, you know, there's stuff very well, very well argued out on that side, you know, people with different positions hashing it out and a lot of quite quite reasonable stuff. Um, I think it is fair to say that there aren't a lot of countries that have participated in this debate, um, but I think, you know, if you look at what the U.S. is, at, you know, the Snowden NSA, Cyber Command, blah, 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 revelations, I think what what you see is that the line that the U.S., draws publicly is very, very different than what the U.S. actually does. And it's this sort of weaseling around and saying, you know, none of that actually applies because we're not actually at war because, you know, this is a war on terror, which is a war, but it's not a war, and it's all intelligence stuff, and, you know, so on and so forth, so we can, you know, run over the private sector with hobnail boots because they're foreigners, and foreigners don't count either, and blah, blah, blah. You know, th this... This isn't, this isn't mature behavior, right? We, at some point, this will have to mature and people will have to take a public position that is in line with their actions. And, you know, but we're just not there yet. Um, just to add uh, to what uh, Jay said in terms of the GGE, I th the GGE right now, for those of you familiar with the Human Rights Debate, uh, the Human Rights Council's resolution affirming that human rights apply online as well as offline. 
Um, you can think of the DGE process, or I, at least I, I, that's the way I think about it, as si the exact same for international humanitarian law as the international community is trying to now affirm that it applies online as well as offline. And um, the reason why that hasn't been the case yet is because China has argued that um, it doesn't apply and that there should be an entirely new set of laws, but that uh, seems to have changed uh, this year. And the Talon Manual, to put that into context, is, uh, goes back to the Center for Excellence and in many ways is a little bit ahead of the curve in that political negotiation because it already looks at once you have it affirmed, how do you actually translate it to cyberspace? Um, and I think um, the, most of what we see is actually stuff that remains below the threshold of the armed attack that would trigger international humanitarian law. And we haven't even started the, de the debate yet about what uh, norms and rules should apply to sub-threshold attacks. So this goes back to a resolution from the Russians from 98, and it's taken us 15 years to get to the point to actually get the Geneva Conventions applied, not to mention getting to the point of actually talking about most of the activity we are seeing. Um, and just a final point on what uh, Bill said in terms of the Chinese doctrine, this goes back to, again, the human rights piece. I think there's a cybersecurity has gotten so broad um, that we need to be very careful about the way we use terminology. And the Chinese understanding of cybersecurity is in many ways the, the terminology of information warfare and information security, which uh, arguably is a Trojan horse for human rights debates because it includes content. And what's interesting is that you had a similar debate in the U.S. where in the 90s you had a debate between information warfare as, and Jay, maybe you can jump in on this, uh, that conflated psyops with what we now call cybersecurity and attacks that could have a physical impact. And those two were eventually separated again as you had a back and forth among different constituencies in the Department of Defense. And uh, Martin Lubicki has written some excellent writing on this of how this got disentangled in the U.S. context. And I think th that's in the, at the international level, we now see a replay of that debate that took place in the U.S. in the 90s. And we still see this content being in included in that as a, as a hidden human rights debate. Okay, I think I have to be my own um, mic person here. So I'm going to go one, two, and then three was here. Uh, thanks, Ron Diebert from Citizen Lab. Great panel. Uh, I was going to make a remark about um, the, the um, uh, I hear a phrase often uh, said that there has been no cyber war. And I think that's true, but it's also a bit trite because the fact is that no armed conflict today takes place without uh, uh, the ICT having an important component in that conflict. And especially in low intensity armed conflicts uh, of a domestic nature. Um, so you look anywhere in the world today, Syria, for example, in the case of Libya, um, ICTs, cyber, played a huge role. Um, there's a study that a Citizen Lab fellow, John Scott Railton, did on Libya and the role of uh, malicious software and targeted electronic attacks in that case, I think, is especially useful uh, to look at. So in discussing the nature of cyber conflict, I think it's important not to lose sight of uh, those cases because they're actually the most interesting ones and they're not uh, at the level of anything uh, involving the superpowers or the great powers and they're, uh, and they're unfolding in ways that have no relevance also to things like the Talon Manual because it's completely unorthodox, uh, you know, non-traditional, low-intensity violence. That's a great point. Anyone want to pick up on that? Let's, tr let's try it. Why don't we try the other one? Bill, can you pass that over? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great point. And the question is, do, are we moving in a, in a world where conflict as such is actually becoming less violent? And Thomas Ritz kind of argument using the Clausewitzian definition that war is a continuation of politics just with other means. And do we see the, the level of violence actually being reduced and we are seeing conflict just becoming more, uh, less violent, and therefore we need to reconceptualize conflict, and which would make the, the studies that the Citizen Labs has been producing a lot more relevant because politics and influence and violence is being exercised in, in a different way now, especially online. Um, so I yeah, totally agree with that. But it's one of the things that we found as we were doing the history is that there's tons of conflict, and every time that you're seeing a conflict in the real world, whether that's between activists, whether that's between countries, 
you can start to expect, actually for 15 years, you could expect there to be something happening on the internet that that was going to mirror this. And, and I think what Ron has brought out was that that had started with being harassment, you know, someone putting a picture of their butt on your webpage. Um, it is now especially getting particularly more, more virulent o o over time. Um, and so it's, 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 a worrying, it's a worrying trend. But a strong note of caution is that we've been overestimating the impact of disruptive cyber attacks for decades. We first came across the phrase um, electronic Pearl Harbor or digital Pearl Harbor, wh which um, the U.S. Secretary of Defense brought up, I think, just last year. Um, in 1991, so, Cybergeddon, yeah. So we've been talking about a digital Pearl Harbor for 20 of the 70 years since the actual Pearl Harbor. So there's, that's, w that's why when we say there's lots of cyber conflict, but, but cyber war perhaps not yet, um, because obviously there's a different dynamic going on if we've been saying this terrible cyber attack is going to bring down a country, and 20 years on we're still saying it. Hello, my name is Andrei Kolesnikov. I'm uh, head of uh, Russian CCTLD.ru. And I have a question for Bill, obviously. Uh, where did you get all this conspiracy data? I mean, I, I live in Russia. I'm involved in all these, you know, aspects. But uh, your theory it looks like a Batman movie or something like that. You're involved in all these aspects? Uh, of course so I'm involved. Just come to you? Oh, of course sorry. I'm involved because I'm in charge of .ru, the uh, main um, name. And uh, I know all the data. Uh, about the most recent DDoS attacks, and of course we, um, of course we analyze all this data and we're trying to find the source. And you're probably aware that the average DDoS attack is about fifteen hundred dollars in price. Yeah. So how do you? Dis the question is how you distinguish? Uh, how do you make a difference between Russians, uh, as Russians, as the people who live in Russia and who pay fifteen hundred dollars? for the average DDoS attack for Estonia or Lithuania or, I don't know, Thailand. And, uh, and the Russian officials, who is uh, who's also were mentioning in your presentation, like Putin and Surkov, et cetera, et cetera. How do you build the line between them? Right, yeah. It, it, so, uh, first of all, uh, attribution is difficult, right? And um, there is there is this there's this problem that in communication between internet engineers and political people, right? Political people want to know who is responsible. And if you ask an engineer that, the engineer will tell you that answer is functionally impossible to give, right? Um, because there are so many variables, attribution is so difficult, if you start trying to trace this back through the internet, you will hit so many dead ends that, you know, at some point you'll wind up at some keyboard and you won't know who was sitting in front of that keyboard, right? Um, so a lot of attribution winds up being giving up on trying to do 100% accurate um, we know this for certain and we could prove it in a court of law. And going to who claimed responsibility? Was that possible? Um, who had something to gain? Who is dancing around responsibility, right? Who is saying, oh, isn't that a shame? Uh, wouldn't it be a shame if that happened again tomorrow? But no, I have no idea how that possibly could have happened to you, my enemy, right? Whatever. It, it, the it's really tricky, right? Um, a lot of this comes down to sort of detective work and people admitting things after the fact, right? So a, a year and a half after the Estonian attacks, um, two of the Nashi people who were involved um, made a series of admissions about who they'd gotten orders from and so forth. At the time, you couldn't get that information. Right? In, in 2007, that information was not available. Those people had not, you know, stood up and said, you know, here's who I got my orders from. So, 
Yeah. Right, yeah, I mean. So I mean, the comment was the information was not published, but it was there before. Facts exist, right? I mean, there is some objective reality, but knowledge about that is very constrained, and some knowledge gets lost over time, and other knowledge dissipates out over time. And so it, everything that you saw there on those slides was stuff that I dug up by talking to people or through public records, right? Um, oh, yeah, and, and yeah, and I'm sure that there were many, many, many more things that, that I knew nothing about, right? Um, part, part of my point at that time to NATO was that these few examples of attacks against external targets that follow exactly the same pattern as other known attacks, um, you know, they all kind of follow the same playbook, same uh, botnets, so forth, and most of those were against internal targets within Russia, political targets. Right, 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 right. Yeah, okay, so, so the, the question is that that slide showed half the story, right? That slide showed attacks against targets that were uh, not friends of the Russian establishment, right? Whereas all the attacks against the Russian establishment were not on that slide. And ab absolutely, I, you know, that's what the slide was, right? The slide was about things that were plausibly Russian offensive operations, right? And absolutely, the Russian government gets attacked all the time. Russian people in power get attacked all the time. Uh, you know, all Russian political parties get attacked all the time, not just opposition parties. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, no, I was not trying to make it seem one-sided. That, that slide just happened to be one-sided because that was what was being And then Yuri had a comment, and then I'll join in too. Just to um, share how, you know, CJK, you know, treat this. We never know, you know, the, the source of the, you know, attack source. It's very difficult attribution. Sometimes, um, you know, the, the PCs launching the, you know, attack is a proxy, you know, compromised, you know, resources. So, um, but we're not asking the responsibility, you know, we, if the attack, if, if we see the attack coming from Korea, even though this is compromised PC and there or not the attack is sitting in Korea, we're asking them to collaborate and we're asking for, you know, coordination. And they would do that. I think imp the important thing is develop the norms that, you know, doesn't matter if you are conducting or not, if you're holding the responsibility or not, if you got the request of coordinating, you know, to, um, stop the attack, we all, you know, as a shared network operating, you know, community, we need to collaborate. And I think that type of, uh, you know, norm building is important. I think that, that is healthy. And what we saw, I mean, if you remember at the beginning, I talked, we've got these things about technical truth that says these attacks, you know, cyber attacks are difficult to warn, they happen speed of light, um, it's difficult to, to at, uh, attribute them to know who is responsible. In almost all of these cyber conflicts, none of those things were true. And it's, it's almost like, um, uh, to me, it's, it's almost like a quantum uncertainty. You know what I mean? The smaller you look at an individual attack, the faster it seems, the more difficult to know who it is behind those specific ones and zeros that are coming your way. As you start looking at the things that have been most strategically significant, between nations or for cyber, uh, certainly between nations. Um, it, it, you're no longer worrying about specific ones and zeros that are going your way. You're looking at a campaign of attacks that unfold over a long period of time. So most of the things we talked about here were not over at speed of light. They happen over weeks, months, even years for some of these. For example, Stuxnet. Whereas if you're looking at the ones and zeros, it's very difficult to know who's behind it for attribution. If you're looking at it as a national security conflict, 
it tends to be far, far easier because you have the context of, na of, of nations that are angry at one another. Um, Stuxnet, as soon as people realized who it was going after, they said, this is, for, this is US, Israel, or both. And they were correct. Um, for, um, for Estonia and Georgia, um, the people that looked at it as a technical issue would say, oh my gosh, this is coming from 178 different countries. We could never figure out which country is actually responsible. And that's true at this level of attribution. That tends to you know, start at the packet level and work and try to build a case. I worked at the White House. If I would have been at the White House during the Estonia attacks of 2007, the advice to the president would have been two things. One, some of these attacks are coming from the United States, and we have to stop these. But obviously this is taking place in a geopolitical context where Russians are really angry at Estonians. So if we really want to try and ease the, ease the tensions here, let's pick up the phone and call Mr. Putin. So it's different sets of truths that are at the top. Or was he prime minister then? I'm not sure. My name's Cyrus Rasul from Freedom House. Um, I just had a question about Iran cyber program. Uh, recently, the head of their cyber program was reportedly assassinated. Um, I was just wondering if this is a sign that foreign governments are becoming more concerned about Iran going on the offensive, um, and if there are any examples of Iran carrying out cyber attacks on other foreign governments, um, and if you could just give maybe more information about their current cyber capabilities. That's a great question. Thank you. Well, I, think, I think the big example, of course, is the Tuesday, Thursday attacks against the U.S. financial sector, which are, I think, pretty well understood to be retribution for a retaliation or whatever for the Stuxnet and, and you know, subsequent American attacks against Iran. And I, I think... Um, there, it's very hard to tell sometimes what is posturing about capabilities and what is uh, actual offensive action or actual offensive capability. Um, I think militaries in general find offensive capability inexpensive to develop and, and put into effect, and militaries by and large sort of throw up their hands and give up on the notion of doing anything defensive at all. And so in the conflict between the U.S. and Iran, which has been going on for several years now, I think what, what's really problematic about that is not Iran attacking the U.S., which is pretty understandable under the circumstances, since we did it first, right? Or, sorry, when I say we, I mean here the U.S. We get caught doing it first. Yeah. Um, I think what's really problematic is the lack of closure within the U.S. between the private sector that is the victim of the Iranian retaliation and the public sector, which keeps doing new attacks, right? <laughs> it's the, the, the private sector is who loses on both sides, right? The, this, is, this is really the big problem with cyber warfare, right? Is, the way I try and explain it is there's no no man's land in the internet. There's no uh, high seas, right? It's all a private sector network right. that some actual person put their, you know, opened their wallet and invested and built. And so when militaries run around rampaging around doing offensive operations, it's all over networks that the private sector owns and operates and tries to keep working. And so, you know, in, in the case of Iran attacking U.S. financial sector, they understand that, right? They're attacking civilian targets. They know that. The U.S. saying, oh, you know, we do highly targeted attacks, right? I mean, that's, that's bullshit, right? The, well, yes, they, it was a military target, right? Or, sorry, it was an energy sector target. Oh, it's part of a weapons pro I mean, it's, it's okay. at least in the U.S. view, it's part of a weapons program. Okay. I mean, I think that's... But getting there is over the bodies of civilians, right? And that's, that's a problem. And uh, yes, I'm speaking figuratively. I'm talking about networks that are civilian-owned and operated. And that's problematic in both directions. Yeah, I'm really, 
so also certainly the the mainstream U.S. view is Shamoon attacks on Razgas and Saudi Aramco also fit I into into um, these attacks um, or counterattacks back from Iran. That always worries me a bit as someone that's kind of in this as a historian because if I look at I can go and I can see the lines of evidence for Stuxnet and I can examine some of what's you know what's been written on that I can look at Estonia Georgia and look at the ex look at that or Chinese patriotic hackers or Chinese espionage and I can examine that through um, for these these Iranian counterattacks for Raz Gastrum and finance sector I'm largely having to work on what people that I really trust are coming back and saying that yes, this is Iran. So I'm still, I still don't have a high level of confidence about that because we still, the U.S. government and private sector has still been largely quiet about the lines of evidence that leads to, that leads them to say it's Iran. I, as far as the assassination, I mean, this fits in with, um, uh, or the killing. Let me say right that because there's a big difference between killing and assassination, and this could have been a jealous lover, right? I mean, um, and. It fits in with, I mean, it may fit in, it certainly seems in the head to click in with the assassination of nuclear scientists also. To me, I would find it incredibly bizarre if someone killed someone in charge of a cyber program. Because this stuff is not dangerous, right? I mean, it, it really isn't. It's annoying. It can steal your intellectual property. It might ruin your company. Um, but that's a far cry from having... It, in, Almost none of the cyber conflicts we talk about here, actually, I would say probably zero, had any of these cyber attacks had any strategic impact. They didn't win a larger war. They didn't get the other side to, to coerce. Georgia might be the only example that I'd come up on that. Wasn't there a series of assassinations in Italy around uh, uh, ICT forensic stuff? And yeah. um, That's probably more criminal, right? I mean... E yeah, but yeah. I mean, yeah. but I'm saying from a seriously. cyber attack itself, none of these conflict. I mean, it's difficult in these conflicts to say, "Wow, the you know the that one side used cyber stuff and it really just won the war." I mean, it it's it hasn't really. I mean, we we've, we've tended to overemphasize this. So again, I'd find it bizarre that anybody would, you know, do an assassination attempt in in another country based on this stuff because. You're saying Dick Cheney was worried about somebody turning off his uh, safe thing? Yeah. But just going back, um, it's not internet, but it's packet-based networks. Sorry, John Selby, Macquarie University. Um, the use by the North Vietnamese forces of uh, English translators in the Vietnam War where they were intercepting unencrypted communications over packet-switched radios deployed in the field in Vietnam enabling their troops to avoid B-52 bomber raids um, was a, a significant impact on the US losing that war. So the ability to intercept communications does have a big impact on a war. So I would argue that you know, we may not have seen it yet, but there's possibility there. Yeah, the, I mean, a big part of what the Chinese say in their doctrine is that you've got sort of two parts to this. One part is understanding all of the enemy military logistics, right? Understanding their supply chain, you know, being able to disrupt it electronically, so forth. And the second part is dispiriting their civilian population so that their civilian population won't support a continued war, right? So it's sort of two thrusts, and uh, both of those have military goals. I just wanted to um, the Vietnamese example. Uh, I think the actual past, I don't have a, a straight answer to that, but there are other examples for during um, Napoleon, when he uh, when he used uh, light towers to signal whether an enemy would actually come, um, that you would set lights, uh, that you would set the fire accidentally to to maneuver the troops in a different direction, while you would actually attack at a, at a different spot, and the fire was also a means of communication. Um, but I think where it gets tricky is where do you then start to draw the line of what is considered um, warfare on an attack, and I think that's where it's important to differentiate between what is actually a, a weapon and an attack um, and what could have a physical impact and what could have a, a, a virtual impact that goes beyond just um, the, ins the instructions as code but actually like content. 
And I would argue there's a distinction here between communication and code as instructions that has a payload that could have a destructive effect. And That's great. And, and, um, and to clarify, when I'm talking about cyber conflict, what you described was, was specific signals intelligence. And um, you know we could go we could go back a long long way as, as Tim just mentioned in looking at this intelligence and grabbing other people's communications. What really struck us in these cyber conflicts that we talked about here was how much the dynamics were incredibly similar, even as the technology changed. So we picked Cuckoo's Egg, this 1986 case of espionage, very specifically, because if you look before that, you can see cases of Computer, people talking about computer security or computer crime or computer fraud or signals intelligence or electronic warfare, all these different things. Um, and if you can look at these cases, like you just mentioned, and you don't need to think differently about cyber conflict to understand the case that, that you brought up. What we found stuck together for Cuckoo's Egg and in every one of these where their dynamics were not just different from signals intelligence or electronic warfare or something else, but they were similar through the years. There, that where there was this underlying dynamic. You could take Cliff Stoll, the guy involved in Cuckoo's Egg, and you could put him looking at a Chinese espionage case or a US espionage case or a denial of service attack, and he would understand it even though there's been 25 years. And by analogy, you could take a fighter pilot from any one of our countries and put them together with a fighter pilot, I'm sorry, from 1916, take a fighter pilot from nearly 100 years ago, put them together with a fighter pilot today, and even if they don't speak the same language, buy them a couple beers, but those two fighter pilots from nearly 100 years apart are going to understand each other, and they're going to be, you know, doing this with their watches, um, because even though technology has got so much more dangerous, I'm sorry, aerial fights, aerial weaponry has gotten so much more dangerous at faster speeds and over tremendous range, the fundamental dynamics of fighting in the air haven't changed. And this is what really struck us as we thought about this as cyber conflict rather than just attacks. Because we're told for cyber attacks, oh, it changes every day. You know, the only constant is change. It's not really true if you're looking at it, how the underlying dynamics of conflict go. So I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, because we're already starting to be over. Um, so my, my apologies, because I know there was more. So I, I said how this dynamic seems to be the same. I'd like maybe just two minutes from each panelist, because we're already over, on what you think is going to happen next. Um, so we've gotten to here. We've said we haven't had a cyber war yet. Give us the next you know, three to 10 years in what you think is going to be interesting either for conflict or what you think the trends for, for norms or confidence building is going to be? Um, so I think something that Ron Debert wrote in his book, Black Code, I thought was interesting was the connection to malware developed by criminals. And I'm, I can't predict the future, but will express my, what I consider to be a concern is that we'll actually see more of an interplay between malware developed by states and malware developed by criminals, with the former actually being a composite of what criminals have developed, packaging it together, adding some new stuff to it, and then uh, you have this kind of like uh, development taking place. Uh, so that's what I'm concerned about. And the last point I want to make, uh, as you know, there might have, there have been some cases of plagiarism in Germany. So the idea of Napoleon was not my own. That was something that a friend told me. And if you're interested, I'm happy to give you the real source of that uh, analogy. I think... Um the, the collaboration that I mentioned about this um, technical, technical collaboration as a part of the confidence building measures um, is getting a trend. Um, it's, there's a lot of them, um, the UNGGE um, report mentioned that it is the important um, you know, mechanism to um, reduce and limit the um, cyber conflict uh, risks. So um, I would like to, you know, emphasize that you know, importance and the effectiveness of this here, and um, hope that, um, you know, it's going to be implemented to the um, rest of the, you know, world as well. The most important thing is bring the other parties. We have to overcome this perceptive 
and bring the other you know parties to be part of the you know CBM. I think I'm with Jason. I think the more things change, the more they stay the same. I think um, you know governments will continue to do what governments do, and criminals will continue to do what criminals do, and it'll be difficult to tell the difference. And I think. Um, you know, the, the one thing that seems to be changing over time is globalization of people's perceptions. I remember going to a law enforcement and cybercrime conference some 15 years ago and hearing complaints from law enforcement officers in developing countries that, uh, you know, they would nab a suspect and the suspect would demand to be Mirandized, would demand to have their rights read to them, despite the fact that they didn't actually have those rights because they weren't in the United States, but they'd all been watching U.S. cop shows on TV, so they thought that was how law enforcement was supposed to act, right? The interesting thing there, though, is that as people um, begin to partake more and more of global culture, they can see better ways of doing things. They can see ways of doing things, of, of holding people to higher standards. And so, you know, it may be that standards of transparency will become more the norm. It may be that people will hold their governments to uh, higher standards of, you know, not attacking people while claiming not to or whatever. Um, so I'm hopeful about that, but I'm not hopeful uh, for self-reform by government. You are so glass half full. That's great. Um, and I'll just leave with all the cyber conflicts and cyber attacks we've talked about here have tended, you know, as I've said, no one has died from them. It's easy in cyberspace or Internet to take a target down. It's very difficult to keep it down over time. Um, it really does take a lot of resources to keep it down over time because a cyber attack only takes down things made of one and zeros. It only attacks things made of silicon. The more that we start doing Internet of Everything, the more that we start doing smart grids, um, connecting power plants and dams and driverless cars and robots and embedded medical devices, as, long as we're at attaching that, more of that to the Internet, then I am concerned that the norms that we're creating now, whether it's Russian, Chinese, <laughs> or U.S. norms, because we've all been attacking, um, give us much more wary, probably not in the next three years, but in the next ten. Um, because when those targets get attacked, um, it's not just ones and zeros or silicon that breaks, it's concrete and steel. And we might look back to these days not as just the days when cyber attacks were so terrible, which is what we feel now, but these might seem like the utopia days when nobody really died and cyber attacks didn't actually bring down societies. And we might be facing that if we don't do the CBMs that... Um, uh, confidence building measures that Yuri talk about, and if we don't do um, security for Internet of Everything and Smart Grid, and if we don't get Internet governance right. So thank you for being here at IGF. Thank you for helping us try to get Internet governance correct, and thank you for your time and attention.